In the late 17th century, many Croatian writers and philosophers had in mind Pierre, an idea of a state, a state for all the South Slavs. You see, Southern Slavs have a long history of being occupied by various different empires. Many Croatian writers and philosophers believed the only way for South Slavs to gain independence and freedom was to unite into one stronger state. However, it wouldn't be until the 19th century when things got more interesting. It was at this time that the intellectuals, especially in Croatia, had been pushing the Illyrian movement. It was based on a myth that the Yugoslavs, meaning the Serbian Slavs, were all descendant from the ancient Illyrian people and should therefore naturally live together in one state. Finally, right after World War I, Yugoslavia was formed. Yugoslavia took its place as a kingdom, with its first king being the former king of Serbia, Peter I. On April 6, 1941, Yugoslavia was invaded by the Axis. Although the Axis won the invasion, Yugoslavia would turn around and surprise the world. Yugoslavia had its single greatest anti-Axis resistance movement of any country during World War II. This was largely due to the formation of the Eurostyle Practitions. The Eurostyle of Practitions, mostly referred to as just the Practitions, was a communist-led anti-fascist resistance to the Nazis. The Practitions were organized at the initiative of a communist revolutionary with the name of Josip Broz Tito, who was most often referred to as Schest Tito. After Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, the Yugoslav Partitions began their active guerrilla campaign against occupying German forces in the Yugoslavia. In autumn 1944, the Partitions and Soviets liberated Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia, and by the end of the war, the Partitions had gained control of the whole country. Tito, the leader of the Partitions, ruled the country as prime minister and then president of the now communist Yugoslavia. After the war, Yugoslavia changed its name to Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia and later Socialist Fe Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. At this time, Yugoslavia had turned completely into a communist state and modeled the constitution of the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia established six republics and two autonomous provinces, but the part of Serbia. The federal capital was Belgrade. The policy focused on a strong central government and the control of the Communist Party and on the recognition of the multiple nationalities in the country. Yugoslavia solved the national issue of national minorities and identities in a way that all republics and nationalities had the same rights. Just like all the other communist European countries, Yugoslavia initially aligned with Stalin and rejected of Marshall Plan 8 in 1947. However, in 1948, Tito decisively broke away from Stalin on other issues, establishing Yugoslavia as an independent communist state. Yugoslavia then sought American assistance. Although American leaders were initially divided, they eventually agreed and began providing financial aid on a small scale in 1949, which expanded significantly from 1950 to 1953. It's important to note that this American aid was separate from the Marshall Plan aid. After Stalin's death in 1953, relations between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union softened, and Yugoslavia was now receiving loans not just from the US, but also from the Soviet Union. Therefore, the quality of life for the people in Yugoslavia rose, but the money was not used equally in all of the regions of Yugoslavia. The northern two republics of Slovenia and Croatia decided to use the money to build up a strong economy, while their sovereign republics like Montenegro and Macedonia decided to use the money in glamorous, glamorous show-off projects. This resulted in a split in the economy and the country and grew tensions between the republics. The country would run relatively smooth under Tito's strong leadership until like in Eddy, when Tito died. You see, when Tito died, they didn't have anybody else to step into power, so they introduced a collective presidency. The presidency consisted of eight members, one from each republic and one from each autonomous province. 
This decentralized federal government struggled to address rising challenges and it also split up the country even more. The ineffective consensus system at the federal level in their decision making, especially concerning served interests. So, in 1987, a Serbian man named Snobin Milosevic gained control in Serbia. Essentialist policies recently served Serbs, and he effectively took charge of Kosovo, Vojvodina, and Montenegro. Later on, he would also get control of Macedonia, adding four of the eight members in the presidency, making him able to veto any position he disliked. Milo Sedic's actions intensify the ethnic divisions and undermine the barricade balance within Yugoslavia. Party leaders in Slovenia and Croatia opposed Milosevic's centralization. They advocated for greater democratization inspired by the revolutions of 1989 in Eastern Europe. The clash between Milosevic's centralism and demands for democratization fueled tensions further. On June 25, 1991, regions with Croat and Storin majorities declared independence for Croatia and Slovenia. Nationalism had inflamed ethnic tensions to a breaking point, leading to the dissolution of Yugoslavia. The collapse of Yugoslavia was like a house of cards, with nationalist ideas tearing apart the fabric of a once unified nation. The primitive nationalism of provincial leaders combined with political missteps blocked democratization and ultimately resulted in the Yugoslav Wars. The creation of Yugoslavia had denied self-determination to its diverse peoples, and it's this denial healed nationalist movements and conflict. In the end, the dream of a unified Yugoslavia shattered, leaving behind a legacy of war, division, and the birth of an independent successor states. It was self-Slavic nationalism that had sparked the idea of Yugoslavia and it would be Serbian nationalism that would destroy it.